Well, good morning, everyone, um, and you're very, very welcome. My goodness, hasn't this Zoom world made us all so punctual? It's so great to see so many people um, logging on and with such uh, haste and precision this morning. Um, welcome, everyone, to the virtual launch of Smart D8. My name is Dervil MacDonald, and it is a privilege to join you as MC for today's launch of an initiative that could truly transform the health and well-being of citizens in my former much loved neighbourhood of Dublin 8. Uh, Dublin 8 is a stunning, resilient, resourceful, creative and really, really tight-knit community. I, I miss it terribly and it is so exciting as a former resident to see the potential that Smart 8 holds for this magical quarter of the capital through the innovation and collaboration plans we are all going to hear about today. It's wonderful to see so many stakeholders join us today and in such significant numbers for today's conversation. Uh, you come from the worlds of healthcare, academia, government, business, public bodies, from digital health companies to major multinationals, as well, of course, as our local community leaders and organisations. So you're all very, very welcome. Today, we are going to get an insight into the ambition of Smart E8 and learn how you can engage to help build the ecosystem that will make this project the success we know it can be. We will hear from a range of community and partner leads, and we will also be joined by Professor Jackie Oldham, the internationally renowned Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Oxford Corridor and Health Innovation Manchester, amongst many of her accolades. But first, to officially launch Smart It, let's hear from the Minister for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and, Simon, and Science, Simon Harris today. Minister, you're very welcome this morning. Thanks so much, uh, Derval, and, and great to be uh, virtually uh, in D8. I think I'm in D2 at the moment, but uh, but near, near, near enough to you all, and uh, I look forward to us all being able to meet uh, in person again in the not-too-distant future. I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to be here today, and I'm actually extremely excited uh, about this initiative and about the scale of the ambition uh, that you're showing. So it is my great honour to be here for the formal launch uh, of, of Smart D8. I was so pleased, Erbil, in your in your opening comments to hear you you talking about the word well-being. And if something good has come out of the last year, I think it is the fact that we're talking about well-being so much more. We all know our well-being has taken an awful battering, right? Uh, this pandemic has been ferociously difficult for everybody in this country. But finally, we're actually talking about well-being. We're talking about mental well-being. We're talking about physical well-being. We're talking about how it's okay not to be okay. And we're not just talking about a health service or a country that just steps in or intervenes when you get sick. Uh, I spent four and a half years as Minister for Health. It was a great honour. I worked with the most incredible people, but more often than not, I felt like the Minister for Illness. Um, we were spending a tiny proportion of money and quite frankly, a tiny proportion of time talking about and investing in well-being whilst constantly responding and trying to look after people when they actually got sick. Uh, and we need to inverse that. We need to turn that on its head. We need to look at what we can do to keep people well in the first place, how we can empower them to keep themselves well through a whole range of initiatives, how we can create healthy communities and how all of us state actors can play our part um, in trying to create a healthy country uh, and a country and communities that value uh, well-being as well. Well-being isn't something kind of wishy-washy. Uh, it's not just a nice kind of soft thing to talk about. It actually has a massive, massive bearing uh, on, our, on, on our life. Uh, on the life of our family, on how we will progress, on how long we can live independently, and how we live our lives, and we'll get into some of those topics uh, in a moment. I'm now obviously the Minister for, amongst other things, research, innovation, science, and I'm particularly to be pleased to be here uh, in this regard, because I genuinely see this initiative, quite frankly, as a microcosm of what we need to be doing nationally, uh, and what we need to be doing globally. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, principally, I mean two things. Firstly, if we're serious, about tackling major societal challenges, be they economic challenges, be they community challenges, we have to embed research in everything we do. So if we look at the COVID pandemic, we have been at our best as a country when we have followed expert advice. And quite frankly, and quite honestly, we've been at our worst when we ignored it. So we have to embed expert voices in, 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 in all that we do, in policy making, and thank God we live in a country where I think people in this country value that. You'll remember, you'll remember in a country not so far away, a very prominent government minister saying, we've heard enough of the experts, send the experts home. And we know how that worked out. I never want to live in a country where we send the experts home. I want to live in a country where we value expertise, where we value research and where we embed it 
uh, in all that we do, be it locally, regionally uh, or nationally. And I'm so pleased uh, to see you doing that. The second thing I think this initiative is doing that is crucial is it's breaking down silos um, and it's collaborating. We have so many brilliant institutions in this country, in academia, um, in research, uh, in our health service, uh, and indeed in industry. But we have too many fiefdoms. Uh, we have too much kind of territorial concern. Uh, how am I mind in my patch? And no matter how brilliant people are individually or how brilliant your organization is, we are always much more brilliant uh, when we actually come together. And I don't need to tell you that because that's exactly uh, what this initiative uh, is doing, bringing together lots of different disciplines and lots of different organizations and saying, how can we all pull together uh, to solve a problem uh, and to come up with solutions? And in fact, the scale of you, the scale of the number of you involved only became apparent to me when I tried to write out the list to thank those of you involved. And it's a very long list. And I'm sure I'm going to leave some people out, but some organizations out. But St. James's, our local authorities, the Digital Hub, on Kassan, the HSCE, the ESB, Maynooth University, the Guinness Enterprise Center, the Tyndall National Institute, St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, Trinity Research and Innovation, Trinity Translational Medicine, the National College of Art and Design, the Health Innovation Hub, on Kassan, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I've ever been at an event with as much collaboration uh, as Smart uh, D8 uh, potentially offers us as well. So congratulations, Cohortigas, to all of you for coming together. So in terms of embedding research, in terms of finding solutions, and in terms of collaborating, you're leading the way. And I will, as Minister for Research, be pointing to this project uh, as an example of good practice and an example of where we need to get to in, in all that we do, uh, in all that we do nationally. Uh, the, the phrase that the last year has been challenging is almost ridiculously cliched at this stage because we all probably say it a hundred times a day how difficult the last year has been and God it has. But there are some things we can learn from it. And, and indeed there has to be some good that has to come from it. Um, there has never been, the, the good thing about this from a historical perspective, if you look at major global events, something good always comes from it. UN, European Union, the National Health Service in Britain, something good can always come uh, from a massive uh, from a massive shock to our world. What good do we want to come from this? I think is a question all of us in politics and policy making and in civic society need to ask ourselves. I get really annoyed uh, when I hear some political colleagues and indeed when I hear some media commentators talking about going back to normal. Now, if going back to normal is when can we do all those lovely things that we took for granted that we miss, sign me up. But actually the scale of our ambition needs to be much more than going back to normal. Uh, going back to normal would mean going back to a country in which huge inequality exists. So we need to, I think Joe Biden stole the phrase before me, but we need to build back better. We need to actually say, how do we improve things as we rebuild our country, not just to rebuild and reopen, uh, but try to reimagine. Uh, and, I, and I think that's one of, the, one of the lessons that we need to take from COVID. The second, I think, is we have seen the magic that can happen when research and expertise comes together with civic society. I mean, we have seen over the last year, people who worked in the shadows for years, the Luke O'Neills, the Kingston Mills, the Tony Hoolahans, the Ronan Glynns, the army of people behind them. We've seen them become household names and we've seen how well civic society has responded to interacting uh, with expertise and advice. Um, we've, some of the biggest societal change has been brought about by involving expert voices uh, and civic society and trying to come together um, in a deliberative democracy. Uh, and I think that's what you're trying to do here uh, in the Smart D8 initiative bring all the expertise together, but not just talk to this, not just say, here's what we're going to do in D8, actually engage the community. So research and civic society coming together is, is definitely a, a huge opportunity arising uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. The second one I think is all too often research and science has been seen as something abstract, something over there, something done in a lab, something that affects somebody else, somebody, something that's done by somebody else. COVID again has made it very real and um, very, very real. And I think we have, a once in a generation opportunity now to excite our communities about how we can look at things, look at problems in a different way. Um, and, and I really, really want to commend you uh, for doing that. I think this is a project that very much builds on that concept, an opportunity to not talk about research in a kind of academic -y way, but to bring it to, into a community uh, and make it very real uh, and very practical. And look, that is what this initiative is doing. I am kind of bowled over um, by some of the work that you've already begun to indicate. We know that we know that Dublin eight residents have health indicators that are largely in line with a lot of the rest of the country. But we also know that 31% of people living in this part of our capital city do have a long-standing health problem. 
we know that nearly one in three, 27% of access mental health supports over the last two years. We know there's a lot of unmet health needs. Uh, and we know that probably like a, a lot of the country as well, the overwhelming majority of people feel that the pandemic has really impacted their health and their well-being in a negative sense. I'm excited about the fact that you're going to focus in the first instance on mental health, on population health, and on the COVID-19 uh, impact. And just really to offer two thoughts on that, we're about to launch a new national adult uh, literacy, numeracy, and digital skills strategy. And um, we live in a country with a lot of very smart people. We also live in a country where we ignore a reality that there are so many people locked out of full participation in our society and our economy because they can't read, they can't write, and they can't use a computer. One in eight of us can't read properly. One in five of us couldn't understand our ESB bill from a numerical point of view. And almost one in two of us can't, uh, don't have the proper digital skills. If we don't rectify that, we're gonna have a recovery that's gonna be really unequal. And I don't even just mean that in, a, in an economic way. From a health point of view, health literacy is so important to outcomes as well. So to see the focus that you already have on what you're calling the HANS uh, project, the Healthy Aging for a New Digital Society, I think that's a transformational project um, and very much look forward to working with you in the context of our new strategy. Second issue you've, 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 you've hit on in, in some of the briefing that I've read is the issue of how do we keep people living in their community longer? Um, I feel really, really passionate about this. There'll be another day to talk about the lessons from COVID in terms of nursing homes and congregated care settings, but it is a failure of policy. It's not a failure of the people working there. It's a failure of successive policy for which I too uh, take my share of responsibility that we live in a country where we decide at a certain age, you pack your bags and move to a big house and live with a load of other people. And it's not to talk down nursing homes, there's many fine ones, but, but when did that become acceptable? Or why do we want that to be the norm that when I reach a certain age, I have to leave my community? And what you're doing through this initiative is looking at what policies, mechanisms and supports can we put in place to keep people in their homes, in their communities much, much longer. And I think the Irish people are gonna demand action from us on that. They're going to demand that how we care for older people in society radically must change in the aftermath of COVID. And I'm delighted to see Dublin 8 and the Smart D8 uh, project leading in that regard. I won't go on any longer because you have a huge amount of speakers to get through and people much more expert uh, than me. But I want you to know that what you're doing here is an example of best practice. We are going to try and deploy a level of focus and resources to research and innovation that quite frankly has been missing uh, for decades. Investing in research and innovation is not a nice thing to do. It's not a kind of warm and fuzzy thing. If we don't do this, we fall behind. Um, and that's why we've set up this new department to try and drive this agenda. And we're really looking forward uh, to working with you. It is so easy to identify problems in life. Uh, many people make a living out of it, but identifying the problem is only the beginning of the journey. Actually coming up with the solution uh, is what we've got to be about. And that's very much what Smart D8 is about. I, I wish you all the very best for this. It's my great honor uh, to formally launch this initiative. And I look forward to getting to visit you uh, and see your outputs uh, in the coming days, weeks and months. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I think you're so, so right about um, that interdependence and the integration and how the solutions going forward are only going to be when people actually come together and work together. I know you have an insane schedule today and I know you're going to try and stay with us as long as possible. But if we don't get back to you before uh, the close of the session, um, we appreciate your time this morning. You're right that we do have a packed schedule. So I'm going to uh, introduce you to our first partner lead today, who is Miri Day. She's the CEO of St. James Hospital Campus. And I think Miri, you're going to talk to us about the campus's ambition and how Smart D8 aligns with those plans. You are very, very welcome this morning, Mary. Thanks, Dara. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Minister Harris, colleagues and neighbours. I'm delighted this morning to be to say a few words at the launch of Smart D8. Uh, and working as a lead partner in Smart D8, it presents an opportunity for the St. James's campus to have a key role in transforming the health and well-being of our population through collaboration and innovation. And the Smart DH initiative aligns with our own strategic ambition here on St. James's campus to create a world-class health system around the St. James's Health Campus. Um, St. James's Hospital uh, with its academic partner, Trinity College Dublin, we have, we have an ambition, we have an overarching ambition to evolve into Ireland's first academic health science centre. And that is a fundamental reshaping of the hospital university model. And this strategic shift reflects international experience that demonstrates that when we integrate education, research, innovation, and clinical services delivery in an academic health science center, it significantly improves both patient care and research, but contributes to the wider innovation and knowledge economy. 
Um, in St. James's Hospital campus, we will in time, as we know, we're going to be home to the new National Children's Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital Ireland. Uh, in time, we will we'll be home to the Coombe Women and Infants University Hospital. And the campus will rank amongst the largest and most contemporary and comprehensive health service science centres in Europe, uh, employing upwards on 10,000 uh, when we're fully operational. Um, so there's a unique opportunity here to leverage the current development of the hospital campus in order to revitalize the Dublin 8 area and establish that health innovation ecosystem. Uh, the campus will be an anchor tenant in providing regeneration opportunities and services to the local population. And in partnership with CHI, we will be Ireland's first state-of-the-art digital hospital campus. Uh, and there's an opportunity for Ireland's growing digital industries to work hand in hand with this healthcare space in order to create a dedicated healthcare innovation hub. Over the next decade, we know the digital world will continue to evolve to provide a more personalized approach to medicine. And the Dublin 8 Health and Innovation Hub, I would argue, will become the state's Silicon Valley of health innovation. So working as part of this consortium, we're committed to working on improving the health and needs of our citizens. And I think the minister has reflected that in his opening comments and something that I'm also very passionate about. We, we, we talk about, you know, we, we spend a lot of time looking after the sickness and, and the illness, but it's, it's about us improving the health needs uh, of our local population. And so if we look at the Mercer's Institute for Successful Aging here on St. James's Hospital campus, led by Professor Roseanne Kenny, Kenny We've already got a very strong Dublin 8 community outreach. And we've, you know, with, with numbers of researchers and scientists and clinicians in that space, we have enabled rapid knowledge ex exchange and innovation to develop new services and technologies and deploy those from the hospital to the home. And closely aligned with the innovation corridor, we host regular knowledge exchange uh, workshops with the digital hub and have been doing this since 2014. And just to note our Dublin eight social prescribing research program, which has been very successful and was commended in 2019 by Prince Charles and something we, we are very proud of. And I suppose moving to the Trinity St. James's Cancer Institute, this is another prime example of where the campus is developing a center which will integrate innovation and groundbreaking cancer science with patient focused clinical care. And the Trinity St. James's Cancer Institute is the first Irish cancer Institute to be accredited by the Organization of European Cancer Institutes. This was benchmarked against the highest international standards and aligned with the strategic ambitions of both the National Cancer Strategy and the National Development Plan. And in Trinity St. James's Cancer Institute, there's a once in a generation opportunity to transform cancer care in Ireland. So the focus of the Smart Dublin 8 pilot projects on the three themes of mental health, population health and COVID-19 resonates very much with the priority areas for our health delivery system. COVID-19 has presented enduring challenges to our lives, not just physically, but also mentally and socially. And we're now seeing the looming issue of long COVID. And we're looking at that there's, you know, identify that 30 to 40% of people uh, are suffering longer term effects after the acute uh, COVID-19 infection subsides. That's creating an additional uh, ask on, on our health system. On the St. James's campus, we aspire with our community health partners in uh, Community Health Area 7 to develop an integrated ambulatory care institute with the ambition to deliver that exemplar integrated healthcare model. The institute will, accom will accommodate care shifted from the acute hospital to a purpose-built facility on the campus in line with Slauncher Care and the community enhanced community programs. And the overarching ambition of this institute will be to provide local care tailored to individual needs of the of patients with, within chronic diseases and develop a partnership arrangement and to promote that acute community primary citizen integration to deliver the comprehensive range of value for money quality services to protect the health and well-being of the local community and very much as referenced already shifting that dial from treatment to prevention. And within this institute, I would envisage that we'd have a dedicated population health office to accommodate this. Finally, I just want to say the close proximity of the Dublin 8 Innovation Corridor to the St. James's campus creates a major competitive advantage for development of a thriving health, academic, innovation and business ecosystem. And we're very excited here at St. James's Hospital campus to be a lead partner of this unique consortium. 
Thanks very much, Darva. And so, so much, Mary. My goodness, the Silicon Valley of health innovation is something that is certainly, uh, it, it's well worth holding on to that phrase because I think it um, really sort of encapsulates the, the vision for all of this. But thank you um, for your presentation. Um, we're now going to hear from Owen Keegan, Chief Executive of Dublin City Council, about the role of the City Council and how this district model approach can help accelerate innovation. You're very, very welcome this morning, Owen. Uh, thanks very much, Derville, uh, and good morning, everyone. Look, I, I'm very pleased on behalf of the City Council uh, to join in welcoming the, the launch of the Smart D8 initiative. And I can say we're really looking forward to working closely with our lead partners, St. James's Hospital and the Digital Hub Development Agency, and indeed with the other health sector, academic and uh, business partners in driving the initiative forward. Uh, from our perspective, uh, Smart E8 joins a small number of smart districts already established under the Smart Dublin program. Each initiative is tailored to the needs and potential of the particular district, its local community and business sectors. The basic idea is to leverage the assets of public sector agencies in a defined geographic area and to work with academic and business partners to drive innovation with a particular focus on shared public policy objectives relevant to the area. We believe this model of collaboration can accelerate innovation and give innovators, researchers and entrepreneurs an, opportun an opportunity to develop their ideas and grow new businesses in a way that can benefit the local community and help meet the needs of the district. So I think the experience and just echoing what the minister said, the experience of the past year with COVID restrictions has increased our awareness of the potential of digital innovation and technology and I think more importantly of the importance of health and well-being. And I think the Smart D8 initiative is really well positioned to build on the momentum that exists in both these areas with a view to delivering to the benefit of citizens in the, in the Dublin 8 district. So uh, I just want to thank uh, Bruce and Stephen in our South Central uh, local area office who are involved and indeed our Smart City team who are involved in um, es establishing the initiative. Um, uh, we are looking very forward, very much forward to, to working and, and driving it forward. And I want to uh, uh, wish Orla, uh, who's leading the initiative, all the very best and to promise her our continuing support. Thank you very much. That is absolutely fantastic. And we'll be speaking, um, Owen, later on to Orla um, about the, 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 the pilot calls and, and those calls to action. But uh, let's move on to our next guest. It is, our next guest is the CEO of the Digital Hub, which, as we know, is the largest cluster of tech, digital media and internet community in Ireland. And it's all in the heart of the Liberties. Faith McAneil, I know that on its own, the Digital Hub has its own huge plans. But where does this all fit in in the urban regeneration of Dublin 8? Well, good morning, uh, Dervil, and good morning, colleagues, uh, minister, uh, deputies, uh, local councillors, uh, and neighbours. Um, yeah, we, we're very pleased of Digital Hub, Dervil, to be the lead partner in Smart D8. For those of you who may not know much about uh, the Digital Hub, here's a quick snapshot, Dervil. Uh, we are a state agency and we're under the direction of the Department of Environment, Climate Action, and Communication. And we, have, we were tasked with three objectives. First of all, to support and develop a diverse digital and technology cluster in the heart of the Liberties area of Dublin 8. In fact, as you said, we are the largest cluster uh, of digital uh, technology companies in Ireland. And our role is to support, very simply, companies, research institutions and individuals who are solving problems for Ireland. And of course, the Smart EA program, working with population health, working with the impact of COVID-19, and more importantly, working with health and well-being is a perfect uh, fit for, uh, for the Digital Hub. We have a lot of sub-clusters in, uh, in the Digital Hub, particularly in health, uh, but also we're looking at climate action, the creative industries, travel, and so forth. And we're open for business. So if any companies out there or individuals want to locate a Dublin H, come and talk to us and come and talk to our to our colleagues. We have lots of spaces. We have maker spaces, both external outdoor ones, internal studios, laboratories, collaboration spaces and offices. And more importantly, we have we have two communities working together, the business community and the local community. And we know the history of Guinness in the Liberties over the last two to three hundred years business and local neighborhoods working together, living together is a part of what we may call a sustainable community. 
The second objective of the Digital Hub is that we are uh, our commitment to a digital learning program and working with our local community in association with, uh, with uh, local partners, including the Robert Emmett uh, Community Development Program and indeed of Cusson. Uh, we have several programs across STEAM and STEM programs, including science, technology, music, film and art. And actually, if you look out uh, in our forthcoming program with the National College of Art and Design, we're doing a, a webinar series around the challenges and opportunities of artificial intelligence, AI. And we're working closely with our own artists and residents, Elaine Hoey and Dr. Rachel O'Dwyer, who is a, an expert in this area, who works and teaches in NCAD. So a lot of collaboration in the area. And as Mary mentioned before, Derby, we do a lot of knowledge transfer work with the St. James's Hospital uh, on various areas, whether it's AI, and technology, AI, and, med and medicine, and it's it's a uh, so in a way the smart D is, is a kind of a, an end of one particular journey, which is acknowledging that collaboration across all sectors do occur. So, so finally, then the objective of the digital hub, the final objective, is urban regeneration, uh, including the areas and liberties, and um, in particular Thomas Street, where we are at the moment. And we have exciting plans to support a sustainable community and create a tech quarter amongst our neighbours in Dublin Eight look out for future announcements on that. And that is why, in my view, I think Smart D8 is an intrinsic part uh, of our work. So we see ourselves at that intersection between creativity, uh, technology, and community. And I recently visited, we're going to, excitingly, we're going to hear from Professor Jackie uh, Oldman. Uh, I visited her in November 2019 in Manchester and saw for myself uh, the highs and lows, the challenges and the successes of, of the Oxford Road Corridor and Health Innovation Manchester. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can listen to what Jackie has, has told us. We can uh, observe what she has to say and, and perhaps offer more insights as to the future uh, collaboration uh, in, in the Smart D8 and how we can benefit local communities, inspire new ideas and innovation to solve, in my view, societal uh, problems. And I think to, uh, to contribute to a more creative and sustainable community of which health and well-being is at the heart of it. So finally, I just want to thank all our partners. Uh, I won't do the, the, the challenge that our minister did in naming them all because I will forget them, but I want to thank them all. But I also want to pay particular tribute to the inspirational leadership of Mary Day in St. James Hospital. She's an extraordinary new and, and, uh, and neighbour of ours now, so we're delighted to have her on board uh, uh, in our community. I want to thank uh, Dublin City Council, in particular Jamie Cudden uh, and um, Bruce and Stephen from the local office, uh, but particularly pay tribute to Ora Veal, who was a programme manager, and to my own team at the Digital Hub, who have supported us all in developing this, and particular Caroline Begay and Stephen Brennan. Thank you, Derville. Thank you so much, Bake. I am um, so relieved that everybody else is doing all of the thanks because there are so many uh, partners and people involved, which is perhaps um, a really, really uh, wonderful tribute uh, to, to the scale and ambition of the project. And I'm uh, delighted to introduce you for a little conversation, just something slightly different, to Maria Flanagan, who is the community partner lead with Anne Cosson, and also to Austin Campbell, who is CEO of the Robert Emmett CDP, and who also represents Corn. You are both very, very welcome um, to this. Maria, I might um, just maybe start with you because the mission, maybe for those who don't know of Ancason, is to empower individuals and communities through education. And so I suppose to ensure the inclusion of the most marginalised groups across Ireland. And I was wondering, maybe could you just give us a little bit of an insight in, into your work with Ancason and of course, um, with, with, within Dublin 8. Thank you, Dervla, and th thank you very much for inviting us to participate today at this very exciting initiative. And to give you a bit of an overview of Ancasan, um, Ancasan is a, a social enterprise that was founded back in 1986 by uh, our founders Anne Louise Gilligan and Catherine Safone. What started out as a dream from their kitchen table has now grown to a community education project based in Tala with the national reach all across Ireland. And our mission, I suppose, is to empower individuals and communities through education, ensuring that we include the most marginalised communities across Ireland, as you've already pointed out. The word Ancasan means um, pathway, so Ancasan offers a path into education from our little ones right through to our adult learners. And we do this through three main services that we provide. Uh, we provide early years education and care centre in our centres in Tala, Whitehall and Cabra. We offer counselling and family supports, and we have an adult education, uh, adult community education through our classroom-based model in Tala, and since uh, 2014, our, our new innovative model 
of online community education. And we offer education at every level from access right through to further education and higher education awards at level six and seven through our partnership with IT Carlo. And some examples of the courses that we offer that would be relevant to today's session are personal development, women and wellness, mindfulness, enabling well-being, addiction studies, and then community development, leadership and social enterprise. Um, our community education model is really le learner centered with a very holistic um, ethos. We provide hospitality. In Ancasson, if you come, you get a, a warm welcome, um, a warm scone every morning when the learners come in. That, and we know the importance of nutrition and nourishment for the body and mind. It's so important to ensure that people's basic needs are met before they have to engage in a class. We also provide the wraparound supports, the counselling, family supports that I mentioned earlier, and the learner supports. We have a mentorship programme with a bursary fund and we have a laptop loan scheme to um, provide laptops for learners that don't have them. We also have uh, a short digital skills programme for people who, for maybe digital skills is, is a difficulty. Ankasan have been working on bridging the digital divide for many years and we have developed a range of digital skills assessment tool and we are also developing a basic digital skills course in line with DIGCOM, the European framework. So it was really good to hear the minister speaking about the, this initiative like earlier on. One learner actually summed up our ethos in one sentence to me before when they said that Ankasan allowed me to be before I had to do. And I think that's quite a powerful statement when you think about it. Because we know that there are many barriers out there. And as a result of our community partnership model and our multi-stakeholder approach, we respond to these barriers to find solutions by working with the different organizations that we work with. To date, we have engaged with over 180 organizations and, and supported learners in almost every county in Ireland. We offer continuous professional development courses for community workers and educators to support their work on the ground. An example being our technology enhanced learning course. We also, the local community organizations provide access to learners on the ground locally. Uh, they provide that community space and the technology required to do a class like the laptop, the headset and the internet, things that we take for granted, but they're not always available for many, many of our learners. Our work wouldn't be possible without the valuable support that we receive from a large number of government agencies, which enables us to continue to do the work that we do. Yeah, and to, just to, to the, because one of the, obviously the organisations that you are involved in, one of the memberships is the Community Organisation and Residence Network in Dublin 8. And I know, Austin, that you're here with kind of in, in two capacities, um, obviously with the Robert Emmer CDP, but also as a as a member, um, uh, you know, of Corn. And I was wondering, you know, maybe can you tell us about your work um, in, the, in the local community? Yeah, thanks, Derville, and thanks, Orla, for the opportunity of talking about the work we do in the community. And good morning to Minister Harris and all the other distinguished guests. It's an absolute pleasure to share a platform with you all and to be included in something like this and to have a community voice is, you know, it's absolutely great. Um, so I'll begin with a quick description of Robert Emmett CDP and then I'll move on to Corn if that's all right. And I'm going to briefly proceed that, I guess, with um, saying why we do what we do, because our why is absolutely vital to our work and informs it. And we do what we do and we do what we do passionately because we believe that the Southwestern inner city is a little bit of an anomaly. It's full of strong characters. It's got a very strong sense of identity and cultural heritage. It's got very strong um, stakeholders in the area like the Digital Hub and everybody else. The area is full of potential, but the statistics that Minister Harris cited uh, 31%. I'm just looking at the sheet I wrote them down on. Um, I was listening very, very intently. Um, with the 31% with significant health needs, the one fifth of people who can't numerically understand an electricity bill. There, there's significant need in the area, and the community has been relatively inept at capitalizing on the potential and contributing to the process that affected over the years, over the decades. And this is immediately apparent by taking a two minute walk down the road, you'll see a, a high level of dereliction and over concentration of vulnerable populations, a relative lack of green space compared to other areas. And these things only occur or only occur at that sort of frequency in an area where community members aren't able to effectively express themselves. And you only get what you want when you tell your story in a very particular way and I guess that's the main thing that both Robert Emmett, CDP and Corn strive to do. We support the local community to understand and tell their story in a way that it will be heard and acted on to create conditions for a healthy and progressive community. 
Um, so all of Robert Dammit's programs are designed to empower people. At individual level, we operate two social enterprises, Inner Shoes Walking Tours and Inner City Beekeeping Project, which um, the Digital Hub support. And both of these empower individuals through co-designed employment and education opportunities. At community level, we provide rights-based training and other supports to local residents associations and also deliver community consultations and have probably shared on the report and the community consultation we recently delivered in the regeneration of Oliver Bond House with a large number of today's distinguished guests. We've also been tasked by Dublin City Council Park section with bringing together a consortium of local organisations to design and manage a portion of Bridgefoot Street Park as a community facility. And there's lots more similar examples. Everything we do is about collaboration. Um, and then with Robert Ahmed, I guess we also deliver all the classic charitable programs. We have an after school program, adult education classes, and all of that. And the work that Robert Ahmed does is very similar to what Corn does. Um, and yeah, you mentioned Corn. You, I think you briefly, you briefly kind of said what we do. We're a uh, umbrella group of 43 local community organizations who collaborate together, I guess, to identify the larger need in the area and identify development opportunities and speak about policy that affects the area in different ways. So I'll just maybe reference, I realize I've done to very much time. So I'm just going to reference maybe two, two ways in which we operate. Um, so Corn operates as a forum to discuss development opportunities. We recently delivered a theory of change webinar that resulted in a submission to the Dublin City Council development plan, which had contributions from 28 local community groups. So it's really quite representative of the area. And we'll also input into the Phoenix Park consultation and the Fever Hospital and Quaker Burial Ground Improvements consultation that are currently open. Um, another main way we operate. Sorry, Dervav, I've gone over. No, I was just going to say, Austin, um, uh, one of the things I loved about living in the Liberties was, uh, was, was a really, really unique social mix. Uh, you didn't get any notions uh, living there, but there was no doubt what you just said. You couldn't deny what the minister and what you have referenced, some of those unmet needs and those social challenges. And we heard uh, earlier on just about the importance of the community voice and how citizens need to be integrated into this project. So I wanted, before we go on just to our next phase, just to ask both you and Maria just kind of briefly, um, in terms of the smart D8 initiative and the needs of the community, how important will it be to embed that voice of the community and what is the best way to do that? And I might just go to you because I know there are big links, um, Maria, um, you know, within Dublin 8. So I might just ask you briefly just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I just want to I suppose, mention too that we would have worked with Robert Emmett and the Two Centre in Swicken and, and the Digital Hub previously who provided face the space for that face-to-face -face workshop that we talked about. Um, and also we're about to launch a, a very exciting project with the, the Ivy Trust who provide uh, affordable housing to people in Dublin 8 across the city and we're really looking forward to that. Uh, but in relation to your question, we, um, based on my experience in Ancasan and working with the communities and seeing that the, the vision for the Dublin 8, I think that there are real many sim uh, similarities at the intersection of health equality and well-being of our citizens and how community education can play a really important role in that. Um, I think when COVID-19 restrictions came into effect, on Cresson were well placed to move our courses fully online and we were a designated essential, were designated essential service to provide the much needed wraparound supports that were needed in our communities. Um, we know from our experiences how critical it can be to, uh, to provide that health and wellbeing supports and never more so in the coming year. The link between education and health is really well known and um, education achievement is strongly associated with, with better health outcomes. Literacy and health literacy and digital skills are all intertwined. And when you invest in education, this has a real strong ripple effect down into the community. When a person develops their personal capacity and confidence through education, they lead, this leads to better job opportunities with higher incomes. Um, their health out, outcome, outcomes improve also. Um, they become empowered and the knock-on effect on this impacts their children, their families and their wider communities. Um, you can see this evidenced by the social prescribing model that was mentioned earlier implemented by the HSE in recent years. Just last Friday, a lady came to our weekly online um, information session and she was referred to us by um, her local pres social prescriber in her local GP practice. 
So by embedding a range of mental health and health and well-being activities and initiatives at every stage in the life cycle. And when I say that, I mean like from our little ones in preschool settings right through to older adults who, who access lifelong learning opportunities and community education centres. You're reaching out to the wider community and you're providing all ages with the tools and skills and confidence to be able to seek help when they need it, you know, that early intervention. And, and just on that point, Austin, just because um, obviously you've brought together huge volumes of groups from the community. How excited are they about engaging with getting their voice into, you know, we heard earlier about that um, when Owen spoke about the shared public policy objectives as a, as a key ingredient of success. So how excited are you just about getting uh, the community voice involved in, in, in the rollout of the plans? Yeah, very excited. I think it's a huge opportunity and that, uh, I guess stakeholders behind it make everything very realizable, even the even our wildest health ambitions for the area. Um, and I think having somebody like Orla Via leading it has been great. I'd be normally quite skeptical of community consultation processes that they mightn't be, you know, truly representative or truly accessible. But Orla came on board and within a week, I think she was delivering the initial community consultation which she came and spoke to CORE and she engaged with individual organizations. And I think that the main thing, like it's got all the resources, it's got all the stakeholders behind it, but the main thing is that, the main thing I'm excited about is that it's truly trying to engage the community and to co-create a solution. So I'm very excited on personally on behalf of Robert and that I'm on behalf of CORE. Listen, thank you to you both. Uh, we do have a busy schedule, so I could chat to you for ages, but I'm going to try and keep us to time and move us on. So to Maria and Austin, thank you so much. And look, I'm delighted to introduce um, our next guest. It is Professor Jackie Oldham, who has secured many roles and accolades, including um, Manchester. Today, we're going to uh, focus on maybe one or two of the specific roles you have, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Oxford Road Corridor and Health Innovation Manchester. I know you've already had the Irish over, Jackie, visiting you in the form of Facebook. But um, can you maybe just uh, share some of your own experience in Manchester and what we could particularly learn, particularly now that we're at the, the beginning of this process? Oh, yeah, and thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me to participate in this extremely um, timely and interesting initiative. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about myself, first of all. I, I'm an academic physiologist interested in muscle rehabilitation and become really frustrated over the years and that telling people they should exercise, how they should exercise, they should lose weight, but in effect, people not taking any notice. So I've spent really the last 20 odd years trying to understand why that's the case and what we can do to understand the needs of the population and align resources to address those needs. So um, Oxford Road Corridor is the dense innovation district at the heart of Greater Manchester. And we've got a population of three million people, sadly in quite poor health. Um, so if you've got that population in poor health, what, what can we do to help them? And if you have a dense innovation district, it's understanding the assets within that innovation district and how you can align them to address the needs of that population. So Oxford Road Corridors, um, a mile and a half by a mile wide. Um, it's got two major universities, major NHS, hospital trust, local governments, local industry, global industry, all together at the heart of this big population with all these problems. And that big population is wrapped around by Health Innovation Manchester. So you've got the Dense Innovation District and then you've got the wider Health Innovation Manchester. And my role as Director of um, Health and Wellbeing and innovation therein is to understand the needs of the population and create the partnerships to address those needs. And that, you know, I don't have a huge team around me. It's leveraging all the assets that are already available in order to achieve that aim. So how do we do that is, is the next question. So first of all, it's understanding the needs. And we now have what we term ambassadors who are people embedded throughout organisations and throughout the community asking what are your needs, not waiting for people to come to us, but saying what are your needs? And that could be anyone ranging from an anaesthetist asking the questions of people in operating theatre 
to an ambassador in our contact theatre asking school children what are your needs so it's proactively asking what those needs are we also do challenge-led initiatives to understand needs so arthritis research uk said we do focus groups with arthritic patients in your community and they were expecting next generation of drugs coming up as need but absolutely to the top of the pile was next generation walking stick so by asking the questions we then validate those needs so are they real needs that's just unique to one individual or is it a, you know a need that is truly a need of our population and that can be done in a number of ways i've not got time to go into that today but in many instances we find existing solutions out there and we just plug those existing solutions in we then get people together in this economic dense academic powerhouse to say how can we address those needs so we take the best needs and we present them in a forum and through covid that's worked extremely well online and it could be the community themselves presenting the need it could be clinicians presenting a need it could be anybody presenting the need to who it's pertinent to and we get the widest audience possible there to hear about that need and we do that because we have people embedded throughout our academic organisations and through our, our industry partners saying, yeah, we might have solutions to that, coming to hear about the need. And you could, for example, we had a stent that required a bifurcation. This is quite a technical need, but it just illustrates an example whereby we had aerospace engineers listening to the need. We had tissue engineers listening to the need. We had stent manufacturers listening to the need and saying, yeah, we can work together to address that. Okay. Think. Yeah, I was going to say, it's really interesting that notion of an ambassadorship model, particularly maybe when resources aren't very strong, but that uh, sort of suggests an issue of both, um, you know, that ambassador role, but also that co-ownership and co-responsibility yeah. um, you know kind of in terms of the solutions that it shared and I'm just wondering you know because the minister referenced it earlier about how that era of working in silos is no more the solutions are going to have to be integrated and all together so how did you kind of break down because I'm presuming uh, that perhaps there might have been some challenges along the way how do you break down those silos and get so many organizations and we've seen it even with the volume of people on this call today but also with all of the thank yous that are going out how do you get all of those organizations to work together to address the needs of population health and well-being it could easily an organization could say that's not my responsibility i'm doing x or y so how did you break down those silos well i think what we found is that um people didn't know about the needs to start off with and so there's huge expertise out there so the ambassador role is incredibly important and those are not paid roles people just do that as part of their day job they're self-selecting um, to say yeah i want to be an ambassador within my organization and scope the expertise and the needs and then to say yeah here's an opportunity for you to hear about a need and align your expertise to address those needs but there's got to be a win-win so for academics, for example, we can say, well, well, you can truly have an impact, but and I, you know, I've got stats demonstrating that in actual fact, they've leveraged far more research income by working on needs. They've got um, greater publications, high impact publications, you know, job creation, etc. Our local industry they found that they've managed to diversify their activities, particularly the local community, um, SME community, small to medium sized enterprise community, where they could diversify their activities. And they've we can demonstrate that we can sustain existing jobs or we can create jobs within those organizations. So yeah, it's been about that's... demonstrating the win-wins and then getting people to come to a forum to hear about the needs and work together to address a need. So how do you do that? Because obviously you know, population health is not a needle that you move overnight. You know, these can be, you know, these are big, big investments. So in terms of assessing the impacts, how do you, what, what does success look like? And, you know, I'm sure there's many metrics and maybe it's having different impacts because you have so many partners, but what have been some sort of the, the, the key impacts that you've been able to say, look, this model, has delivered for this community and all its participants in all their 
you know, differing forms? Yeah, the, the actual um, healthcare indices needs are difficult to measure, absolutely difficult to measure. Um, and, you know, we've not been long enough in the game to actually be able to demonstrate the, the true impact. What we have done is looked at where savings have been made, um, where we've improved quality of life. So one of the needs that came through was um, autistic children felt that um, they were really isolated in society. Um, they would really like to go to our art galleries and become more integrated, but found when art galleries are open at the major points in time, it's too busy and it's too scary for them. So the need then was, how can we organize a solution to that? So our art galleries are open eight till nine in the morning for children with special needs and autistic children and so you can actually then look at the quality of life of those individuals and get that quality saying yeah this has had a huge impact um, other areas of impact one of the needs was people having to go to multiple um, outpatient clinics for different tests and the need was is that how can you actually um, simplify that for us so that all the outpatient appointments are in one on one day so we don't have to keep leaving work to come to outpatient appointment we got people sat around the table to address that we thought it was one of scheduling but it wasn't it was one tool that could do three different assessments um, whereas it required three outpatient appointments. So we can demonstrate the savings then from only one outpatient appointment and then one device to undertake all the assessments. So it's, it's that kind of um, wider impact that we are trying to pick up those statistics for now. What, what, what's really coming through very strongly, uh, Jackie, is that kind of the need to quantify or to identify the needs and to then to kind of activate all of the collaborations. But um, you're a couple of years ahead of us and I was just wondering um, because there are so many stakeholders and partners on board here today and I was just wondering what advice would you give in terms of having been through that process what advice would you give at this stage in terms of the lessons that you've learned in terms of getting engaged or how to do it or what were you know is there anything that you would kind of do differently now in terms of maybe just helping us shape our pro uh, you know process as we uh, as we launch yeah, I think the first thing is, is try not to push any boulders up a hill. Um, what I learned very early on is that there are some people who just don't want to engage for whatever reason. And so it's to work with those communities and individuals, um, both in coming forward with the needs and addressing the needs who are hungry to be involved um, I, I think I had this great idea that everybody would be involved and you know everyone would feel part of the initiative. Actually, I think it's a third who are actively, proactively coming to us and wanting to be involved. A third of people who just say, yes, show me the opportunities and if I'm interested, I'll get involved. And a third that actually fact, just leave well alone. But it's also trying to... Um, reach those hard to reach communities so that you don't then in that kind of model just hear the voice of the people with the loudest voice um, we've got uh, and it's how do you access those people and it's trying to find a way to invite yourself into their environment to actually hear about the needs rather than ask them to come to you it's to be there with them looking at the day-to-day -day problems and finding out the needs from that perspective and I think already uh, they were just uh, referencing how Orla has kind of done that. She's already gone out and speaking individually. Austin was saying to the communities, my last question to you um, is this, Jackie, what has been the most rewarding aspect of being involved in this kind of district model, something that's trying to be the Silicon Valley of, of whatever it is, of, of community engagement or involvement or, or population health and wellbeing? What, what, what is it that is um, that is most rewarding for you? Oh, it's absolutely um, seeing the faces light up when you solve the problem within the community. And just give you one further example, um, a lot of our BAME community were saying that about treating their incontinence, um, we, we, it's too embarrassing to go to a GP. We had our incontinence, this is women from our husband, 
um, developing a new device that allows them to treat their own incontinence in their own home, in the privacy of their own home, and just hearing the feedback and the impact that it's had on their lives. So it's actually, it's that change rather than an innovation push, a need to pull model and the smiles on the faces when you've addressed a population problem. Yeah, for the big picture, right down to the very personal things, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Thank you so much, Jack. I could have spoken to you all morning, but Thank I do you. want to go. Um, you've, you've answered, I think, very well the next question that I'm going to put to our next guest. Um, uh, why are we taking this approach? And we're going to hear from a Dublin HGP, Dr. Philip Crowley, um, who is also the National Director of Quality um, at the HSE. And Philip, you're very, very welcome. Um, but dare I ask, why, why take this approach? Thank you, Dervalyn. This is wonderful to be involved with such a fantastic group of people uh, talking about such an important part of the city. Uh, and thank you, Orla, for including me. Why am I here is, is, is a question one might ask. Uh, I am a local GP. Um, I, I, I've worked for five years in, um, uh, in, in Central America, where after I qualified as a GP, I really, I really learned the power of communities to change their own circumstances. We worked with the local community movement in Nicaragua where they uh, took it upon themselves with a little bit of support, outside support to vaccinate their own communities, to get sanitation and clean water into their communities. And I really learned the power of community there. And, and I took that back with me to, to Newcastle upon Tyne in England, where I set up an organization called Community Action on Health, Essentially, I, I cycled around the West End of Newcastle on my bike, got to know the local communities and created links between those communities and the health authorities to try to improve the fundamentals of health, integrating new families into the local community, uh, working to, to improve the, the experience of ethnic minority communities and working on mental health issues and integration. So uh, that's kind of what I bring to the table here, I guess. And really, uh, as, as National Director of the Quality Improvement Team in the HSE, which which I currently do, uh, we developed a strategic vision of what's a quality-focused health service or a quality-focused health organization, and they're kind of 10 actions. And, and action number 10 is uh, that, part, that we need to partner with communities so that we contribute to improving the social issues that profoundly affect health outcomes. And that's something that I've shared with the CEO, Paul Reed, and something that we aspire to, and we, that's why I'm so excited to be involved here today. We must act on health inequalities. Traditional health promotion can worsen inequalities because it, 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 it enables people who are already quite well enabled. So I think some of the more innovative approaches to health promotion are the things we need to pursue to really improve the health experience of people in, in inner city communities. There are lots of inequalities we have to tackle. The GMS patients access to secondary care for me as a GP is a real problem and is very, very unequal. Obviously, minority groups experience additional obstacles to healthcare, and we need to we need to have targeted approaches to tackle those. And I think the only way we'll improve any of these things is working in partnership to create the building blocks of healthy communities with the communities themselves. I've looked at the literature around community partnership, and certainly there are many things uh, evidence to support what D8 Smart D8 is doing. Uh, you give people greater collective control over decisions and actions that affect their lives and they become more enabled, they become more active, and they become healthier uh, and, and live better lives. Uh, I think, though, in doing so, you need a very clear purpose and, and, a, and a good focus on, on kind of how you coordinate, how you work together, how you share information. And evaluation, I think we've already talked a little bit about measurement, is really important. You need a clear vision and, and, and backed up by an effective governance structure that really builds in community partnership on a totally equal basis. The key determinants are things we need to be tackling, things like employment and income, nutrition, early years support for young, young children, education, housing. These are the kind of things we need to be tackling together. And I know that's kind of the focus of what we're talking about today as well. And peer-led support in local settings is what works in relation to promoting health. So communities obviously need to take the lead and we need to just sometimes get out of the way, support, enable, but and partner, but partnering with the health services, particularly as a way of improving access and responsiveness of those health services. And it's great to see so many powerful health partners uh, partnering here today. Uh, also, I think partnering, uh, we need to partner with communities to develop the community's own responses to local health problems. And there are examples, many of which who they see back to being. 
there are many HSC partnerships to build on. The HSC Health and Wellbeing Program has quite a lot of targeted work with minority groups, and they work with Dolphin House Community Development Association, Fatima Groups United, in the area to to really work on exercise, nutrition, sexual health, and social prescribing for childhood health and healthy aging. That's where GPs can lead people back to the community of resources in the area where they reside. And there's the technology-based Hands Healthy Aging Technology Initiative as well, soon to launch. So in conclusion, uh, and I didn't want to take up too much time because so many important speakers today, but I really think communities are the key resource to improving health. Uh, we need to design the interventions together. We, we don't need experts coming in uh, with, with external expertise alone. We need uh, community expertise and, and external expertise partnering. We need to invest in community development approaches and developing community capacity. Technology is clearly part of the solution. And we as health service uh, providers must partner with local communities to, to really focus on the inequalities that are so well documented in so many spaces. We need peer-led health promotion so people can, can support their own community in, in, in adopting the kind of uh, healthy behaviours and healthy approaches that will, will improve their well-being. And uh, we need to measure it uh, and we need to prove it works so we can test things, prove it works and then spread it. Because we need to spread this outside of D8, obviously. This is the kind of thing that should be happening right across the country. And we need to remember the diversity within the community and tailor support for different subgroups of the community because not everybody is the same. And we need to get beyond issues of behavior and make healthy options easier. So many of the, the partners who are on today, St. James's Hospital, Children's Hospital Ireland, local general practice, uh, St. Patrick's Hospital, and, and of course the HSE in terms of healthcare, we can all support and we can learn from par partnering with the local community. And I really hope that we do so. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me to participate today. The National Quality Improvement Team in the HSE is going to be an enthusiastic partner in any way that we can. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you uh, so much, Philip. And um, I think it's you can really see um, just with the amount of people on board and just even what you've outlined in your presentation uh, this year, the, the infrastructure, a very, very strong infrastructure there already, the sheer volume um, of partners that there are um, to work with. But thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Um, I want to now just to bring you to the lady that is coordinating this all to Orla Veal, who is going to kind of share with us uh, the call to action, how you can get involved and how you can make Smart D8 a success. And Orla, I'm delighted that you're joining us this morning. You're the project lead for Smart uh, D8 and you have some potential homework for everyone who, who are tuning in. That's great, Dara. Well, thank you for the introduction there. It's very kind of you. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides um, in a moment with you now. But first of all, I'd just like to thank everyone today for their contribution. Thank you to the minister. Thank you to our speakers. But of course, thank you for all the attendees who've come to hear about Smart Date and what we want to achieve. And I hopefully look forward to speaking to you all very soon and be, hope you're all very hungry to get involved back to Jackie's point there as well. So I'll just get my technical um, hat on here again for a moment and hope our slideshow works here. One moment there. Always the way that don't worry, I'm the last person of the day, so we get through this now and uh, we'll be flying. Right there. We've done so well so far, we haven't asked anyone to go on mute, so we're doing well, Orla. <laughs> thanks, Terrible. Thanks for your support. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, can you all see that now, Dara, if you don't mind? Yep, we can. Okay, brilliant. So as been mentioned by a lot of our speakers today, um, the collaborative ecosystem is so important to how this project will work. This will be a place where problems can be solved, innovation can be accelerated, engagement with the community can happen. It's a place that we want to be of trust and openness, where people feel comfortable raising problems that need to be solved, dealing with testing of ideas that could fail or win, but really a place where you can work together to try and solve problems. Because as we do know, and what we've heard from the other speakers, the future of health and health and well-being is really together. So that's kind of the first way that you can get involved is come, become part of the collaborative ecosystem, come get involved. You don't have to be located in Dublin 8, even though that's the name to be part of the ecosystem. We're open to anyone who's hungry to be involved, wants to contribute and wants to be part of this initiative. So just get in touch with me directly and I can facilitate and start um, having a conversation with you about that. The other part of how to get involved, we've kind of a formal, uh, more formal structure is around our pilot calls. So we're going to be doing pilot calls continuously throughout this project based on the needs of the community. So again, driven by what is actually needed by the community, we'll be going out looking for calls. 
um, to industry, to whoever wants to get involved across academia. This kind of the details are on the website, but it's not restricted. Get in touch, apply for the pilot calls. So just to let you know how to get involved and into the tangible parts of this project. The partners have been mentioned that we spoke about today, but I just wanted to make sure you got a sense of the ecosystem that's already started to build. So we have people as partners in industry, academia, public authorities, and of course the community is a key part of the partnership as well. And St. James's Hospital was mentioned there, St. Patrick Mental Health Services, Health Innovation Hope Ireland, HSC Digital Transformation, of course, Smart Dublin and Dublin City Council. Of course, the Digital Hub, Guinness Enterprise Centre, Tyndall National Institute, NCAD, Trinity Translational Medicine Institute and Trinity Research and Innovation. So I've got through the list. Just to acknowledge them all, that they've all come together and um, really committed to what we want to do in Smart DH. And I've been blown away by, by the culture that's already starting to form around openness and trust and how relationships are starting to build. And what that is doing is it's really driving great ideas and projects are already starting to form within the partnership model that exists um, even before we expand it out into the broader collaborative ecosystem that we want to create. So just highlighting the lead partners there that was mentioned earlier, James is the Digital Hub Smart Dublin and Dublin City Council. So, so the pillar themes that I mentioned there. So as was mentioned by Austin earlier, um, when I started working on this project recently, the first thing I wanted to do was really start talking to the community. So with restrictions, um, it's all been virtual engagement so far. We have a, a, a bigger plan to keep with the virtual engagement and of course hopefully meet people in person as much as possible and um, over the project over the next couple of years but i just want to say a quick thank you another thank you and um, to deeper support us with uh, funding on the research piece that we did through the public service innovation fund so i just want to acknowledge that and another another thank you i suppose the key thing that came back from the community was around these 10 pillars and we're going to use these pillar themes as the focus area for smart th so mental health population health covid impact positive and healthy aging, education, which refers to a lot of what was talked about today when it comes to health literacy, but also literacy and um, accessibility, digital health literacy. So it's quite a broad area of education and um, to empower people to manage their health. Environment, so the environment in the area that they live from air pollution uh, to, to quality and greening that was mentioned there earlier. Primary care, amputee care, a connected patient in the community. When I say community here, so obviously community is an ethos throughout this whole project. Well, community there is more about a sense of belonging and purpose for people living in the community and of course smart cities which is a key part of this project as well so just to give you a sense of what you can get involved in that these are the 10 pillar themes that we're starting out with and we're going to be working towards um, and based on the feedback of the community constantly feeding into these themes and um, adding to the already the feedback that we've received across Dublin 8. So it was mentioned there earlier that we're going to focus on three uh, pillars initially. So there's going to be pilot calls constantly um, throughout the project. But initially, uh, for the first pilot call that we're announcing today, we're going to focus on mental health, population health and COVID-19 impact. Some of the stats have been quoted um, from our research and from other research during the session today. An example was in our own research was 68% uh, of people said their health and well-being had been affected negatively by COVID-19. So this is outside of people getting COVID. This is just from the scenario that we've had to live in uh, for the last 12 months. So of course, mental health is a huge area that we're aware of that needs um, a further kind of focus um, and even more so now. And of course, population health from our survey and the feedback from the community, there was a lot around how to manage chronic disease. So their own chronic disease management within their home and in the community environment, but also how to just generally manage their own health from a preventative point of view, which has been mentioned today. So keeping themselves well, keeping themselves out of hospital um, and keeping themselves well in the community. So just to give you a little more detail about what the pilot call um, has. So in mental health, we'll be looking for people with innovative approaches to managing mental health for individuals. So as I said, in the community, so tools, including diagnostic, preventative treatment, um, support, management solutions. So quite broad, but a focus call um, in lots of ways around mental health. The second one in population health. So as I mentioned, chronic disease management solutions, again, to allow people to manage their chronic disease in the community. And of course, general preventative health solutions that can be implemented to help them maintain and keep themselves health, healthy and well. And then the last one there I mentioned is an open call. So we haven't kept it too focused. COVID-19, of course, is an evolving um, situation at the moment where we're all starting to understand the impact of it um, in many areas of life. Um, so we kept it as an open call so that if you have innovative ideas, scalable solutions, as mentioned by Philip there, we were looking for ideas that we, if they're successful can be scaled outside of Dublin 8 as well please um, get in touch and apply for um, our pilots. So um, with regard to the application process, um, 
just to give you a sense of our pilot timelines uh, over the next four calls, so just so you're aware, they'll be under different themes. So the first one kicks off today, the 10th of March. Our next call will be in September of this year. The following one will be in January 22, and then, of course, another one in April 22. So there'll be further calls after that. But it's just to give you a sense, again, of a tangible way for you to get involved in the project. So engage with the ecosystem, engage with the pilots, get in touch, and we're making lots of opportunity for you to get involved in a tangible way that we can all work together to deliver real impact um, in the community. So that's the, my last uh, bit of information. I'm just on the practical section of how to get involved. The website link is smartda.ie, which will bring you to the website that allows you to apply for pilots, sign up to newsletters, get in touch with me more of my contact information. But again, my email address is orla at smartda.ie, quite an easy one. So feel free to get in touch with me, anything you want to have a chat about, and I'm more than happy to hear from you. Thank you. That is so wonderful. Orla, that is all we have time for today. Um, I'm so grateful to Smart Dublin, to Smart Date for uh, inviting me to uh, to be part of this morning's discussion. Um, I think the most important thing is answer that call. And as I said, just again, just the volume of numbers and the level of engagement has been fantastic. Thank you to all of the guests for making my job such an easy one. In particular to Minister Harris, who did have to leave early, but sent us a note. And also to uh, Professor Jackie Oldham, all of the community and partner leads, and also to Orla. So look, stay safe and thank you for being with us today. Goodbye. Thank you, Daryl.